Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about a crazy Soviet venture, so it's bound to do well. I look at Mega Projects like, Soviets do something crazy equals views. So here we have it. But just before we get started, I do want to mention another relatively new channel that I run called Explored, spelled X-P-L-R-D. It's more documentary style than you see here, but if you enjoy this sort of content, I think you'll really enjoy that as well. I will drop a link to it below. On February the 18th, 2021, the members of the NASA Perseverance team held their breath as the most technologically advanced and largest robotic system ever to land on Mars drifted down through the red planet's atmosphere. There was little anybody back on Earth could do except wait and hope that the rover, the size of a small car, would land safely. I had no idea how big those Perseverance and stuff rovers were until I saw like the human to scale thing and I'm like, that is huge. It's way bigger than I thought. As news of its safe touchdown reached the team, the relief and joy on their faces was clear to see behind their masks. <laughs> Over the next week, Perseverance began sending images and audio back from the surface of Mars. The world, still gripped by the ongoing health pandemic, watched in delighted fascination. And yet, this intrepid explorer sent from Earth was only the most recent visitor to the planet, widely regarded as the most likely to be able to accommodate a human colony at some point. While we are still undoubtedly many years away from this, our visits to Mars are becoming more frequent. And it all started back in the 1970s, when the Soviet Union became the first nation to land on Mars. If that piece of information is a surprise to you, it totally is to me. I just assumed it was the Americans. Well, this is because this is a story that is rarely told. There's an aura around Mars. The fourth planet from the sun lies roughly 260 million kilometers, that's 161 million miles, or just really, really far away from Earth. And in terms of planets that we might one day inhabit, it's difficult to look anywhere else. It's not exactly a big planet. In fact, you could fit just over six Marses inside the Earth in terms of volume. Despite its blistering desert-esque landscape, Mars has an average temperature of minus 63 Celsius and has the kind of carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere that is deep unkind to us people who love oxygen. What I'm trying to say is that Mars isn't exactly the poster child for habitable planets, but it's certainly as close as we're going to get, for the time being at least. That probably says more about our lack of options than about Mars' welcoming factors, though. Venus is a swirling mass of deadly clouds masking a battered surface of volcanoes and deformed mountains with a toasty surface temperature of 467 degrees Celsius, the hottest in the entire solar system in case you're interested. So, well, Venus is just a bit out. Things are a bit more hopeful if we go the other way, and while Saturn itself is far from ideal from us, being a gas giant, its moons might be a different story. Enceladus and Titan both appear to have internal oceans of some kind, and it's not inconceivable that they might be able to support life. But then we have to think about distance. At 1.56 billion kilometers, that's just shy of a billion miles from Earth, it would take between six and eight years just to get there, which certainly puts long car journeys in perspective. Also, it takes like, it doesn't take like six months to get to Mars. <laughs> Saturn's really far away. This brings us back to our nearest neighbor, named after the Roman god of war, Mars. With the launch of Sputnik 1 on the 4th of October 1957, the space race, which had fizzled at best up until that point, exploded into life. As the Americans gazed up at the night sky and watched the Soviet satellite pass overhead, there must have been a sinking realization that those suspicious reds across the Pacific had got a bit of a jump on them. Suddenly, pride and prestige were on the line as both nations threw everything they had into the space race and the arms race, but that's a different story. In fact, it's a story that we've covered here on Mega Projects before, so how about that? We love the Cold War here, and I love all the views that it gives me. Thank you. The interesting aspect of the space race was that it came with numerous offshoots and numerous milestones that both seemed eager to achieve first. The Soviets held the upper hand during the early stages and put not only the first satellite into space, but the first living being, a dog named Laika, and the first human into orbit, Yuri Gagarin. As I'm sure you are aware, the US were the first to place a human on the moon when Neil Armstrong took one giant leap for mankind on the 24th of July 1969, which left a far more distant and far more complex challenge. Who would be the first to fly past, orbit, and finally land on Mars?
Even before the Americans planted the stars and stripes on the rocky surface of the moon, the Soviet Union and the US had made countless attempts to get to Mars. Between 1960 and 1969, there were no less than 12 individual missions to the Red Planet, eight by the Soviets and four by the Americans. Now, you may well find that figure puzzlingly high, considering we weren't even into the 1970s, but it might seem much more reasonable when I tell you that every single one of the Soviet missions failed, with the majority not even making it into space. Six suffered launch failures, while the remaining two are classed as spacecraft failures, with both losing communications before they could complete their planned flybys. The Americans, on the other hand, attempted just four missions to Mars during this period, the first of which, Mariner 3, also failed to launch, but its successor, Mariner 4, became the first object to complete a planned flyby of a neighboring planet on the 14th and 15th of July, 1965. On the 30th of November 1964, Zond-2 was successfully launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in modern-day Kazakhstan and began its long flight to Mars. It seemed as if the Soviet luck had finally turned. But it was not to be. Six months after launch, all communication with Zond-2 was lost, and while they were able to track it as it flew past Mars on the 6th of August 1965, its cameras and infrared spectrometer were essentially useless as the information couldn't be returned to Earth. Close! but no cigar. To rub salt in the wounds, the Americans completed two more successful flybys on the 31st of July and the 5th of August 1969, and also landed on the moon in the same summer. It was a triple whammy that left the Soviet space program reeling. They were slipping further and further behind the United States, and, well, that just wouldn't do, would it? The early rounds of the space race had been won decisively by the Soviet Union, but the 1960s saw the United States hurtle over them and honestly disappear into the distance. The Soviets, however, had one last trick up their sleeve. Maybe it was the ignominy of watching the Americans walk on the moon and seeing the US satellites pass Mars as planned, but the Soviets upped their game as the 1970s dawned. The early missions under the Soviet Mars program had been nothing short of disastrous, but all of a sudden, things began to really click. And what's more, they were no longer simply interested in flying past and taking pictures. If the Americans had been the first to land a man-made object on the moon, the Soviet Union was sure as hell gonna be the first to land something on the surface of Mars. Within three weeks of one another, in May 1971, the Soviet Union launched three separate spacecraft, all of which were destined for Mars. They really got on with it. Jesus. The first on the 10th of May was Cosmos 419, an orbiter that the Soviets hoped would be able to beat both Mariner 8 and Mariner 9, launched by the US, to become the first object to successfully orbit the Red Planets. Literally a race to Mars. <laughs> Importantly, it would also act as a radar beacon for the two missions hot on its heels, Mars 2 launched on May the 19th and Mars 3 launched on May the 20th. Both of which came with a small lander designed to land on the surface of Mars. But alas, things went wrong almost immediately as Cosmos 419 failed to depart low Earth orbit after a malfunction in one of its engines. It was a bad start, but just over two weeks later, and after two successful liftoffs, the Soviet space program still had two separate crafts speeding towards Mars. And things really were looking up. Both Mars 2 and Mars 3 were launched on the back of a Proton K rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, possibly the coolest day for a rocket. I sat in five. You got nothing on the Proton K, all right? Probably because I watched too much Star Trek Voyager with Captain Proton, but we'll put that aside. The rockets consisted of three different stages that took the probes into a parking orbit before its Block D upper stage ignited, sending Mars 2 and Mars 3 onto their trans-Mars trajectory. The two space probes, now hurtling through space, were essentially identical and contained both an orbiter and a lander tasked with two very different sub-missions. Included on both probes was the 4MB-type orbiter, weighing in at 3,440 kilograms, or about 7,500 pounds. That's just shy of the average weight of a hippo. This is mega projects, after all. You expect some silly comparisons. They were designed primarily to photograph the surface of Mars, while also acting as a relay point for information coming up from the lander on the surface. Both were scheduled to perform a burn as they approached Mars that would put the probes in a 25,000-kilometer altitude, 18-hour orbit around the planet. 
But as complex as the orbiter's job was, it was nothing compared to actually landing on Mars. The landing system was composed of a spherical 1.2 meter diameter landing capsule, a 2.9 meter diameter conical aerodynamic braking shield, a parachute system, and retro rockets. That sounds like an awful lot of things that could go wrong. Altitude control was adjusted using an automatic control system consisting of gas micro engines and pressurized nitrogen containers, while four solid fuel motors located on the edge of the lander controlled pitch and yaw. It came with a main and auxiliary parachute located in the top section of the lander, along with a radar altimeter to indicate how high it was from the ground. Anything parachuting down to a solid surface is still going to experience quite a bump, and the Soviets went with good old-fashioned foam to absorb the shock of the landing. Once the module had landed, four triangular petals would open, hopefully righting the lander if it had landed awkwardly and revealing the scientific instruments below. It had two TV cameras, both providing 360-degree views, along with a spectrometer to study atmospheric composition, temperature, pressure, and wind sensors, as well as a small scoop to dig into the ground and look for signs of life. As I mentioned, the orbiters above them were designed to act as a relay for the information coming up from the landers via four aerials on the top of the module. This is happening in the 1970s. This is mind-blowing. The lander also came with a Prop M rover, known by the less snazzy name, the Possibility Estimating Vehicle for Mars. Compared to the Perseverance rover that recently landed on Mars, let me guess, it was a bit shit. The small box rover was tiny at just 25 by 22 by 4 centimeters, and it weighed only 4.5 kilograms. Instead of wheels, it came with a set of skis, and it was connected to the main lander module by a 15 meter umbilical cable. Considering how long radio signals would take to send back to Earth, the rovers were more or less autonomous and came with two small metal rods at the front to be used to shove small obstacles out of the way if needed. It also came with a dynamic penetrometer to test the strength of the soil found, and a gamma ray densitometer, an instrument for measuring optical density. As Mars 2 and Mars 3 neared the red planet, Soviet hopes were dealt a double blow. First and foremost, because it really came down to prestige, the Soviet spacecraft had been passed by Mariner 9, a US space probe that went on to become the first man-made object to ever enter another planet's orbit. Mariner 9 had blasted off just two days after Mars 3, but its faster speed meant that it arrived on the 14th of November, two weeks before the Soviet probes. The USSR would not be the first nation to orbit Mars, but they could still be the first to land something successfully on the planet. But even here, fortunes were against them. As luck would have it, when Mariner 9 arrived at Mars, the largest dust storm ever seen by astronomers was tearing around the planet. So much so that the surface was completely obscured and Mariner 9 was reprogrammed to delay much of its scientific work for several months until the dust settled. However, the incoming Soviet probes didn't have the luxury of time. Mars 2 was the first to arrive and entered Mars's orbit on the 27th of November 1971 before immediately deploying its lander. It took four and a half hours for the lander to reach Mars once it had been deployed, but after hurtling through the atmosphere at speeds of roughly six kilometers a second, the descent system malfunctioned and the lander's parachutes failed to open. Mars 2 may not have been the first rover to send back images from Mars, but it was the first man-made object to smash into Mars. All hopes now rested on Mars 3. Mars 3 entered the planet's orbit on December 2, 1971, and again immediately detached its landing module. Like its comrade just days before, the lander took just over four and a half hours to reach Mars. But this time, the parachutes, aerodynamic braking, and retro rockets worked to a T, and the lander module from Mars 3 became the first object to achieve a soft landing on the surface of Mars. Now, 90 seconds is not a long time, but I'm willing to bet that for those who were watching the events unfold back in the Soviet Union, it must have seemed like an eternity. 90 seconds after Mars 3 touched down, it began communicating. For the first time in history, humans were receiving information from the Red Planet. It was a colossal achievement. 1971! And one which lasted just 20 seconds. Suddenly, power was lost and all communication ceased. It was the last we would ever hear of the lander from Mars 3. But in that short space of time, it did send something back. A partial image, composed of just 70 lines, arrived back in the Soviet Union. It's impossible to see anything in the image, and it simply looks like an old-fashioned black and white TV screen when it all goes wrong. But make no mistake about it, this technically is the first ever image of Mars's surface. However, the picture was deemed so bad by the Soviet Union that it was never released at the time. But all was not lost for the two Soviet missions. The orbiters of both Mars 2 and Mars 3 continued to send back images and other information between December 1971 and March 1972. 
In August 1972, the Soviet Union announced both missions were complete and communications with the other two probes ceased shortly after. While the landers had not been able to send back the kind of desired information, generally speaking, the missions were seen as partial successes thanks to the 60 pictures the two orbiters sent back to Earth. Photos that, for the first time, revealed mountains of up to 22 kilometers in height, atomic hydrogen and oxygen in the upper atmosphere, a dramatic swing in surface temperature from minus 110 Celsius to plus 13 Celsius, and surface pressure of between 5.5 to 6 millibars, which is less than 1% of that on Earth. It had been a mixed bag of highs and lows for the Soviet space program, but Mars 2 and Mars 3, along with their Yankee friend Mariner 9, helped to completely redefine our understanding of the Red Planet. You need only look at the excitement surrounding NASA's Perseverance rover to see just how captivating a mission to Mars still is. There's something astonishing about looking at a picture sent back from a small machine crawling across the surface of another planet 260 million kilometers away. Mars has long been our ambition, and as I mentioned earlier, our only real choice in setting up another colony on a different planet. This may all sound like complete science fiction at the moment, but the truth is we are getting closer. I mean, we're still some way off sending humans to Mars, but there are certainly steps going in the right direction. And let's not forget that the first step came nearly 50 years ago with a 20 second transmission from the surface of Mars. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to check out that other channel that I mentioned at the top called Explored. I'm going to link to that below. And thank you for watching.